and it's really difficult sometimes to explain what that is because I know his heart and I can see it but sometimes I don't have the words for it and he's dismantling in me the old yeah. right so I'm not a finished product I'm under construction deconstruction the whole thing but he's he's dismantling deconstruct whatever you want to call it so that but all I want is the purity of what he has for us just the purity because if we've got the purity we've got him his heart, his presence, his holiness, his power. But it can't be contaminated by um, what I think, what we think, what I expect, what we expect. It's a total laying down. And, you know, he says to me, you've not been this way before. And I know it. And so that's difficult because if I've not been that way before, I'm not quite sure what to look out for. <laughs> Oh, or what to expect, but he's so gracious and faithful. But the thing that scares me more than anything else, and I shared this with Cambry earlier this week, the thing that terrifies me, not in a bad way, but kind of bad way, good way, <laughs> is that I have to give an account for the state of every soul in open heaven. I have to stand before God and give an account for your spiritual health. And that's rather scary. So for the areas where I fail you, I ask your forgiveness. For the areas where I'm not what you need me to be, I ask your forgiveness. Talk to me. Say, I need this from you or I need that. Talk to me. We can talk things through, but if there's no dialogue and there's no communication, it's really difficult. But I just want to present you mature before Christ. When he put me into ministry, he gave me one uh, Colossians 127, that I would preach Christ and present people mature before him. So that's a pretty broad job description. But my heart for all of you is that you fulfill your destiny and that you achieve everything the Father's written for you to do. And so whatever it is that you require, I'm here to help you get it. But you need to talk to me. And, and let's have dialogue. So um, it's a new thing. And this new wine, this new, new wine requires a different relationship with the Holy Spirit than what we are aware of. So John chapter 16, verse 7. So Father God, I come before you today and I just, I just ask that what you want spoken would be what's spoken, that every word, every noise, every gesture, every intonation, everything would come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that what is spoken here today would carry weight in the kingdom of God, not because of me, but because it's your heart, your will, your plan, your purpose and your power. That, Father God, you would move as you desire to move, that you would do what you desire to do, that it would not be what we expect and not even what we want, but it's exactly what you will for us right now. And we take hold of the mantle that you placed upon this house and we know that we are called and we have a great call. We know that you've called us to the nations. We know that you have called us to do things for you. We know that you've called us strategically and implicitly for such a time as this. And so we surrender to you. We lay down whatever it is that we think we are called to do and we lay it down and we say, you do with us what you want because we're here only to serve you, to serve no one else but to serve you. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. So I'm here to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to be a new wineskin, you need to understand what the new wine is about. And I, I'm just love the Holy Spirit. Man, I love the Holy Spirit. And he is not the third person of the Godhead. He is God. 
we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is God. We tend to relegate him to the third person. We tend to relegate him to, oh, well, you know, there's the Father and there's Jesus oh, oh, and the Holy Spirit. But he is God the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And he deserves as much honour and attention as we would give to the Father and to the Son, particularly as he is in charge of God's kingdom on earth. He is the government of God upon the earth. He is the presence of God upon the earth. He is the power of God upon the earth. He is the one who convicts the world of sin and he's the one who corrects believers. We don't get convicted. The world gets convicted. Believers get corrected. And so we have this amazing Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you something right now, we don't really know him. In fact, the early church, not sure if this should go out on video, but the early church called him she. She. They believe the Holy Spirit was feminine. But that's the early church. I have no idea. Like, I don't know. All I know is I love the Holy Spirit. And he is amazing. But we tend to think of him as a dove. Gentle Holy Spirit, easily grieved, quenched. You know, we can grieve him. We can quench him. Oh, my gosh, the only sin we can commit against that can't be forgiven is the sin against the Holy Spirit. But we don't really know him. We know that he's got gifts and we know that he's got fruit. But you don't really know him. You don't understand the moods of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a corporate lineup for people for healing. So the corporate anointing might be for healing. So that's the corporate one. But as, as people are ministered to, there is an individual anointing in within the corporate one. So one person might be delivered. One person might get anointed with oil. One person might get a word. One person might get a touch. It's all healing. But the corporate one is healing, but the individual things within that corporate one is all intimate and it's all, all tailored one-on-one -on -one because the Holy Spirit knows what we need. But we, we're sometimes even ignorant of the corporate anointing and what falls. The spirit of holiness was here before. The spirit of holiness was here. And we were having an invitation to linger longer in the spirit of holiness, but we didn't. So we need to understand what, what is being released. And this is a learning process. We don't have to get it right all the time. Understand that it is something we grow into. And I just take so much joy when I look at um, my grandchildren or little Roman or whoever and they start to learn to walk, you know. And they take one or two steps and they fall on their bums, bottoms, or their head, whatever, but they fall. And then they get up and they give it a go again and they fall. Or they try to run and they fall. But the parents don't stand there and say, oh, you stupid child, why can't you get your act together? You're supposed to be walking by now. Why? Oh, that's a wonderful, come on, sweetie, come on, sweetie. And that's what the father's like. He's wanting us just to get up and give it a go. He's not expecting perfection because that's religion. He's expecting a heart of love to respond to him. But we don't know the Holy Spirit. So how can you be a new wineskin and hold the new wine if you don't understand how the Holy Spirit works? So in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, it is better for you. It's more expedient for you. It's, it's um, the Amplified says, however, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. This is Jesus. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient and advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter, the counsellor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. He will not come into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, Jesus said, I can send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. So it's better for us that Jesus went back to the Father so that we can have the Holy Spirit. You know, he is a glorious intruder. He is full of glory and he loves to intrude. He loves interventions. He loves interruptions. He loves to inconvenience us. He's just, he has a lot of fun at our expense. You need to understand him, you know. We need to, like, really know how wonderful he is. The thing is, God has called us with certain of our, our assignments. We need to be able to ascend and we need to enable to, oh, we need to be able to carry out those assignments in that realm of ascension. But it's really hard to do that if we do not understand the Holy Spirit. We can understand that we're positioned, we're ascended. 
But when we're given instructions about moving in the spirit realm and I want you to do this or take down that principality or whatever it might be, if you do not understand the moving of the Holy Spirit, it is really hard to flow with God and to get the results that God wants us to get. Now, sometimes I get Suzette results, which is nothing to write home about. But the God results... Like, wow, only God could do this. They're the ones that I want. They're the ones that we look for. They're the ones that we're hungry about. And so in order to do that, the old wineskin's got to be completely dismantled and the new wineskin's got to be allowed to be reworked, rewrought by the Holy Spirit, by God himself, by the power of the living word of God and filled with that new wine. But in order to do that, you need to know how he works for you. He works with you. He is amazing on your behalf. And so we're going to have a look at some of the Greek words just to pull out how amazing he is. Oh, I love the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says that he will come upon us. We will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the, of the earth. Well, when the Holy Spirit has, co has come upon me and I'm a witness for Jesus everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I'm a witness for Jesus. And in John chapter 15, verse 26, again, it talks about us being a witness. It says, when the comforter, the counsellor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener and the standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he himself will testify regarding me, said Jesus, but you also will testify and be my witnesses because you've been with me from the beginning. And so we're going to be witnesses, but you need to understand the Holy Spirit. Like I said, we can quench him. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says, quench not the Spirit of God, quench not the Holy Spirit. We can quench something by snuffing it out. You know when you've got a candle burning and you lick your fingers and you can just snuff it out. We can quench it, smother it, suppress it, douse it, put it out, snuff it out, extinguish it. I can do that to the Holy Spirit. That was a command to us. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about anything else but me. We have the ability to completely quench the Holy Spirit if we want to. Because he's a gentleman. Because in one way. Let me just, I'll explain that further as we go along. But he will not... You've got free will. He will not take that over. Now, I've given him permission to do whatever it takes to get me in whatever position he wants me to be in. So sometimes I find him rather ruthless. <laughs> but I gave him permission. But what, what happens is we're the ones that can quench the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that created everything at the Word of God. How amazing is that? We can quench him just by being in a bad mood. I can ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit and he'll just back off. We've got to seriously understand. Don't be distracted. Ephesians 4.30 said we can grieve the Holy Spirit. That means I can offend him. I can vex him. I can sadden him. I can make him uneasy. I can even make him sorry. And it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on to explain how we grieve him with our emotions and things like that. But I want you to turn to Romans 8, 26. Now, this is the Amplified. It says, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid or helps us, bears us up in our weakness, our infirmities, for we don't know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings that are too deep for utterance. 